OK. So oh, this is a, a set of slides I have been using for 20 years, and every year they change dramatically. And they talk about uh, basically how AI evolved and then has some examples uh, at, uh, at the end of, uh, of uh, things that we are doing right now. And I'm not going to show uh, many of the ones that are doing right now because I want to let Ivy, um, uh, Abby, and uh, Sophia, Ping Sun, present them. So I'm going to skip some of them. This is a long set of slides, around 120. Okay, the first thing is, what is, uh, first, the idea of singularity. Singularity is a, is a term created a long time ago about the moment where machines are more intelligent than people. And, uh, you know, everyone saw the Kubrick movie, uh, 2001, whereby a computer takes over a spaceship. Uh, and uh, so it was more intelligent than the person. Okay, so that's singularity. And I always say at this moment, don't worry about the singularity. Technology is very, very far from any potential singularity. Independent thinking of computers, the only thing that we manage to get is when we try to do autonomous weapons and we create that autonomy to do certain functionality. Besides that, we are not there yet. Let's not, let's let the next scientists worry about that. Then the next thing I talked yesterday is this, um, I asked my colleagues, in the age of Google, what's the purpose of memorizing a lot in class? And in the age of Google, what is intelligence? And uh, typically when I teach this person to person, I have clickers. And the clickers you press, yes, no, vaguely. And I could do clickers in, uh, uh, in uh, WebEx, but I, I think that would just kind of disrupt things. So uh, I assume that many of you heard about, about singularity, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. And then like your question, a lot of people say uh, it's plausible at this moment. Five years ago, people used to say, ridiculous idea, computers, I will never be smarter than people. Okay, and now we go into the history. This guy, Hubert Dreyfus of CBC, uh, in 1964, um, classified AI in four areas. Game playing, like playing chess. Problem solving, which is basically creating new equations and new formulas. Uh, that humans haven't prepared. Dealing with semantics, typically they talk about language translation at time, and then the idea of recognizing patterns. And so that was 1964. And then, and by the way, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, what in 64 was being doing were those areas uh, and for about, they called it the AI winter, for about 20 years they felt that had been no progress in AI. And Feigenbaum, and this is, this slide is wrong, is not the early, early 60s, but early 80s. Uh, and Feigenbaum, professor of Stanford, said, let's stop trying to Develop the ori original axioms in, in language translation, in game playing, doing kind of mathematics from the bottom up. And let's just kind of see what humans can do and capture their knowledge in this idea of rule based systems, uh, which finish up being called expert systems. And companies like Digital Equipment which was second largest computer manufacturer, developed things like 10,000 rules of configuring a computer. And so this area of, of um, expert systems became very, very popular. Actually, it became the fifth area of expert systems. Uh, Dreyfus talked about that. 
And so as natural languages, expert systems, cognition learning, computer vision, we just changed the names a little bit, and automatic deduction. Now, expert systems were so, so important uh, as a part of AI that about 60% of all studies on what we call AI where became expert system. Languages like Prolog were developed, databases, uh, systems using expert systems. And so we basically dominated the literature. Talking about the accounting area, uh, in the mid 60s, uh, a couple of the large CPA firms developed, one was called an audit planner, and the other one, audit risk assessor. And they were basically kind of interviewed a lot of experts and tried to what's called knowledge engineering. is basically capturing knowledge using games, using conversations, using giving them case, cases, and capture rules, and built these systems um, to basically be intelligent on what they do, quote unquote intelligent. Now, uh, if you're talking about the CPA firms around uh, late 90s, early 2000s, they just abandoned it all. Uh, the systems were not good enough to be really used. And a colleague of mine uh, from California, Glenn Gray, and two of my PhD students wrote a paper about three years, four years ago, uh, basically looking at what happened to expert systems. And their conclusion is that uh, expert systems are all over now. Rule-based systems are now part of mainstream systems. And basically, they use human rules in these systems. And so they are not even AI anymore. They are just part of light system. If you, uh, if you want to use your American Express card, uh, when you go in there, there is a rule that says, if the transaction larger than, I don't know, $200 or $500, go to the expert system. If it's smaller than that, just allow the transaction. Unless you are in one of this list of bad debtors or et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this is an expert system in real time. And now they improve this expert system by doing real time information of users. And in some case, so real time that before you uh, sign your sheet on American Express, it sends you a message asking, is that you? And they only allow the transaction if you confirm, yes, it's me and I'm doing this. So they expanded the expert systems with other pieces. So the expert system is what we talked before, a prediction machine. It predicts if a person is going to pay back. And then, and then there is a decision module. Uh, do we give a loan or not? In the prediction machine book, they give a whole example about clients getting mad that they get denied credit and they lose, they stop using American Express. And they, they talk about kind of a operation research derived set of equations that uh, what is the loss if you pay a transaction that you shouldn't pay and then you are, you are responsible for it. And the other side of it, what is the possibility of losing the client and how much you will lose by losing the client. So it's like little operation research type of thing associated with the prediction machine. Very interesting. And it's, you know, it's part of your daily life. It's now start, it's being used uh, in your daily life. I wrote six books about AI and artificial intelligence uh, 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 in the period of, uh, actually, this is also wrong. This was like 86 to 2002, six volumes, and they were basically algorithmic. People talking about algorithms you could use with AI or with expert systems uh, and a and lot of things in auditing. Uh, you still, if you want to spend a lot of money, you still, and Ivy doesn't, is smiling because she has a copy of each one, most of it, correct, Ivy? And for free. <laughs> yeah, they, we had it in the, 
in the library of the car lab, a lot of copies, and so I gave it out to my my favorite PhD students here. Uh, but you still can buy the books. I wouldn't advise you to buy it. Uh, I actually, I probably have an electronic copy that I can build for you. So if you really want it. Uh, now, the interesting things in the literature, in auditing and accounting, um, is that uh, there were several articles published, uh, this Graham and Damons and Van Ness, and Spielberg, Graham, and Schatz. There are two articles on the Coopers and Leibniz. Coopers and Leibniz became PWC, PricewaterhouseCoopers. And they are basically talking about expert tax and risk advisor, et cetera. And then uh, Feigenbaum wrote uh, basically three volumes on expert system that are worthwhile having a look. And the paper I mentioned to you about what's happening with expert systems now is this last one, Gray, Chu, and Lee. Gray is Glenn Gray from Cal State LA. Uh, Vicky Chu graduated and now she's a professor at New York State Oswego. And Chi Liu is a professor now in uh, University of Rhode Island. Okay, and this is actually the architecture of what an expert system would be. Uh, basically, you have this mathematical engine in the middle. Uh, we call it the inference engine. And what is the inference engine? It basically picks up rules and decides which rules apply in a particular situation. And they look, use the typical algorithm called backpropagation. Um, and now you use backpropagation in a lot of the artificial intelligence uh, type of applications. And then there is a knowledge base and there is a method to acquire expert knowledge on it. So these were the, the kind of main, main elements of an expert system. Now this is a system I developed at Bell Labs uh, from 86 to 90. This is still being used, uh, I, I gather. About three or four years ago, I visited the billing organization and they had re, re platformed this from news to Windows, but it still seemed to be working. And basically, it's, uh, it's an expert system. It collects data uh, from what we call screen scraping, picks up reports that are being distributed on this billing system extract the data, puts it in a relational database, and then gives you a layout that the auditor can look and can dig down into reports of it. Um, now, uh, something that you will read in the newspapers extensively, they are kind of yearly competitions, and they call it the Turing test. Now, who was Alan Turing? Alan Turing was a, a British mathematician, a Don from, I can't remember, Oxford or Cambridge, uh, that helped the UK government in the Second World War. He is the one that single-handedly, with a small team, broke uh, the code of the German encryption, the Enigma machine. So he's a very, very famous mathematician. Um, and he did a lot of thinking about, about uh, progress in machine thinking. And so he developed the thing that we call the Turing test. Uh, which basically is very simple. You give uh, a question to a computer, you create a question, and then a person and the machine try to respond it. And you don't know if the person answering is a, is a man or a machine. If you can't identify what came from the machine, what came to the man, uh, it, you, get, you basically say this machine is thinking. And, and, and now there is this low... Lubner Price, which uh, basically uh, is given to people that win the Turing test. And they do it every year. It's, uh, it's very nice because uh, they, you can see all kinds of progresses in this. And uh, basically, the discussion here is AI, is it just hype? Or, or huge disappointment? And what what happened is for the, they had this kind of 20 years AI uh, winter, but now AI is applied all over, but depends, of course, what you define as being AI. You heard Ivy talking about AI yesterday, 
And uh, we don't know how much of that is really AI algorithms or how much of that is kind of wired in into, into the software with some parameters that were not even machine learning developed. So we don't know. But uh, there is no question that many of the problems that AI was trying to resolve are being resolved satisfactorily today using modern machinery. And I always say what I said yesterday, speed of processors, availability of many processors, and huge storage allows you to use the algorithms that you had for 20 or 30 years in a much more effective manner. And so therefore, for example, we're talking about language translation yesterday. Uh, you can create this huge database of equivalent utterances. So in machine, uh, in machine language, machine utilization of translation or of, of word understanding, sentence understanding, you just create very large databases and you deal with that, those databases. For example, in, in translation, you create this matching uh, utterances and just try to match the matching utterances with some kind of equivalent of what the person said. So the stages go a little bit like this. A person issues voice or types in on a terminal. Then it gets translated to textual if it was voice. Then it gets cut into sentences, and then the sentences get disambiguated. You can ask the question, what time it is in Florence or in Rio de Janeiro? What is the time now in Rio de Janeiro? Time in Rio de Janeiro. What does the clock say today in Rio de Janeiro? And basically disambiguate into a common set of questions and look up in the database, and if it's similar enough, that's a translation, or that's what the thing means. And this is very applicable, not only in translation, but especially in cognitive computing for auditing or for anything that's human, uh, human interaction basic that need a lot of knowledge. Um, and this is a little bit dated out of, uh, uh, out of The Economist. And uh, basically, at, in 2014, they said that it would invest $1 billion to develop Watson. And Watson, for publicity's sake, uh, win uh, the world champion in chess and did several things that were very publicity oriented. But now IBM does have a very large business in AI, but it's not only IBM. Google has it, uh, Facebook has it. And the other interesting thing is that they are putting all a lot of these algorithms of the devices in the public domain for people to develop. Uh, what I call this is, again, like ways, group sourcing. They are giving you a lot of the tools that they lose in the hope that you build something good. Um, other thing that you have to think in AI is a little bit like Albert Einstein and the atomic bomb. Okay, is thinking about the future, say, uh, is, uh, Artificial intelligence, a little bit like the atomic bomb, something that can do a lot of good and can do a lot of bad. And uh, this is kind of James Cassio talking about responsibly, responsible future. And uh, Jonas Salk, which developed the polio vaccine, same kind of thing. Looking forward and say, if you develop this technology, technology gives tremendous capabilities, try to understand what dangers it poses to you. Um, and I think AI is that powerful technology, and I am very happy seeing Ivy studying the ethics of AI, because the ethics of AI is part of thinking of the future and, and creating rules for AI. Okay. Now, uh, so I find this fun. This is Metaverse, this came, uh, is kind of looking at singularity and and basically talking about three quadrants, four quadrants uh, of metaverse. One part is the one in the lower left, is mirror worlds. What is that? It's basically creating an imagery, virtual imagery of the world. 
you know, could be any type of representation of whatever you want. But we typically talk about a good example is Google Maps. Google Maps is a mirror representation of physical layout in, in the Earth. And when you are in some place using Google Maps, you are linking that virtual map to your physical location and using it. So we wrote a paper with Jundai. We called it Audit 4.0. And Audit 4.0 actually created a mirror world of audit events happening, uh, basically business processing uh, events, journal entries. And on the mirror world, we created other kind of linkages. Uh, and so that's kind of AI type of thing. The other thing that they talk, the second one, is virtual worlds, whereby you create a total fictitious world, like you would do a simulation using machine learning. Then the third one is this habit that we all have now of live logging. What does it mean? We take pictures of absolutely everything, uh, of your kids, your kids talking, of you going to the bathroom, whatever kind of thing that you do in live logging. I, actually, I read the story of someone that for the last three years carried around the Oculus camera, uh, the, like the old cam Google had, uh, and recorded everything he did, even when he was sleeping, the camera was on. So it's pretty crazy, but if you start thinking about that, uh, can you imagine what kind of information had your heart beats, uh, the nature of agitation of your sleep. Where did you go? Who did you talk? What did you say? Uh, and of course, there is no way to capture all the data um, for entire population at this moment. And then the fourth part of metaverse is what we call augmented reality. And we are doing a project uh, with virtual reality uh, and the idea is students are going to be able to using an Oculus virtual reality. They are going to be attending class remotely and the uh, virtual reality will basically make them think or make them feel in the classroom. They look, le they look left, they look right. Uh, they see the colleagues, they look forward, they see the professor. And then we want to link um, this feeling of, of virtual reality to very different. Uh, you are linking this virtual reality, this uh, uh, virtual reality to what the student is learning and try to provide in the Oculus information to help him. A better example is you go to a soccer game or a football game. You have your VR Oculus that basically films the field. It might, you might use images not from the football game itself, but from the cameras of the television station showing the different angles of the football game that you can choose. So it's augmenting reality for you. And then you can, every time a player comes in, press a button or say something, and it will tell you the name of the player, uh, say his past history, whatever you want to do to enhance your pool. So that's the augmented reality. And these four things together is the idea of metaverse. And so they ask these questions about, uh, you know, what happens if everything that you do or society does get recorded and then faces get recognized uh, and be surveilled uh, day to day. Uh, I have a little story that I usually tell. Uh, there is this horrible story of uh, people bombing the Boston Marathon. And so one person, I think, died and several people got very seriously injured. And so what actually the Boston police did is they went, they had cameras along that beginning of the uh, Boston Marathon, and they looked frame by frame, uh, those things, and they knew that, that uh, the bombs had been placed in garbage uh, containers, so they kind of look at the surveillance of those garbage containers, 
and they identified face that was in both garbage containers dropping a box in there that looked like a bomb. So they used that, they knew who the guy was and etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, they, they knew the looks of the guy, not who he was. So they did something very, very, very dangerous. They published the picture of the guy on newspapers, on TV. And what happened is the a policeman from MIT recognized, like a private guard of MIT recognized a guy tried to arrest him, and he shot the policeman. And policeman died. So when you group source things, you have to think very carefully uh, the consequences of group sourcing. Uh, but you know that uh, then they knew where the person was, uh, and they rapidly managed to arrest. As the person no one else got hurt. Uh, but if you think about that, they needed to go frame by frame examining the cameras. What happens if they have cameras that can recognize activities, integrate that to people, and uh, control where do they go, what do they do, and et cetera, et cetera. Something to be, to be taught. Okay, and then the other kind of cool thing is this idea of virtual world whereby you can live on a different world. There is a lot of concern about psychologists that people will stop living the real world and start living on a virtual world. You know, you look at your kids doing gaming, you start thinking, hmm, uh, is this good for them or this is bad for them? We, Ivy is going to laugh. We have a PhD student that I'm totally convinced that he plays to five to seven hours of gaming at night every day. Okay, then he comes to our seminars and he falls asleep in the seminars because he gamed all day. Okay, and of course, I, I actually used to love my kids game. Uh, I thought it was good for them. Uh, it is, you know, watching TV is very passive. Gaming is, is much more active. And when the games get better, you can do a lot of good social training on kids, which is haven't got there yet. But that's a second part of, of the metaverse. Uh, the third one is creating um, a middle world, and the world can be uh, geographical or can be many other things. Like now, we want a world that is coronavirus related, whereby you create, create a geography associated with pathology uh, and try to develop algorithms to predict algorithms to treat, algorithms to stop people from doing things that you don't want them to do. Like, for example, person is in a very contaminated area. With a cell phone, you tell them, don't move, stay where you are, because you are going to contaminate someone. So, and this is augmented reality, what I talked before. Uh, you look at the face and they say, no, name me Laura. You are Lorna. And... Uh, and you're a good friend, but not great friend. You're only six level, except where they were, what time it was, and she likes sushi. Uh, so this is kind of life logging, reality, and this is what we call. Now, I want to call your attention uh, to a book. And this book is by two MIT professors, Eric Bosham and Andrew McCabe, uh, McAfee. And they are... Uh, basically economists uh, at the business school of MIT, Sloan School of Management. And they basically wrote a series of books about the AI and machine age. And they don't make too much difference between AI and big data analytics, which I think makes sense. And they'd say, um, I'm going to skip a couple of things here. Um, and they say, oh, okay, I don't want to skip this. Just want to call your attention. This part of the singularity thing, and it talks about uh, about the increase in computer capabilities. And if you look at that, the scale in the vertical is logarithmic. The scale of years is linear. And so, if you would have a scale that is non-logarithmic in the left side, these curves would be pretty much vertical. And so, it basically talks about uh, super com computer speed, uh, energy efficiency, 
uh, chip sizes and cost. And as you see, uh, they all kind of went up reasonably in parallel in this logarithmic scale and basically giving reasonably intelligent competences. And what I, I said before that I want to repeat is it is really not about, uh, about uh, machines that are more intelligent than human beings per se. It's about achieving functionalities. And in 10 years, we are not going to have one field of, uh, uh, of artificial intelligence. We are going to have 100 fields, computer vision, machine recognition, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And machine learning will be divided in 20 different subfields, typically applied into different domains. And of course, you'll be able to translate knowledge from one domain to the other domain. And then the questions that McAfee and Joshon ask is what is the effect when you get free content? Remember the economics, we talk about managerial accounting, but the economics on the traditional manufacturing was what? You had a set of fixed costs, and then every new item that you constructed had a variable cost. So you build a telephone, you have a development fixed cost, and then every new company you need to buy a new cell phone, you need to buy a device, the device, you need to buy memory for it, and you buy it from different <coughs> suppliers in China typically, and you assemble it together. And so there is a fixed and a variable cost. However, with software and with new apps, that's not true. With software, the incremental cost of doing a search or the incremental cost of using an app after you did the based on is practically zero. And the incremental cost of uh, picking up contents is practically zero. And so this is the whole world of, of this virtual world that we're eventually living on, whereby you collect data, keep collecting data, and you don't know what you're going to do with the data. The other part of it is something that I I always talk about, and I don't think is recognized enough in the literature, is what I call piggybacking. What is piggybacking? Is the accumulation of technology on top of technology. You have a cell phone. The cell phone has chips. The chips, they have chips and has memory. On top of the chips, you have an operating system. On top of the operating system, you have a database. On top of the database, you might have ways. And ways have a whole set of data that it collects on the public domain of the web and passes some of it to you. And then you have other applications that use locations and etc. So you finish up with a whole piggyback set of applications, one on top of the other. Sometimes you have 10, 20 applications interacting. The other thing is, it's impossible to pick up a large application and di dissect it to, this is perfect. There is no back door, no one tampered, and there is no way to uh, break into it or to make it malevolent. And that's impossible uh, because a lot of the code that you put in applications come from public libraries, you know, you're not going to develop code something from A to Z. You pick up from a library here, from a library there, an application, an app here, an app there, and put it together in functionality. You hope it works. And if it works, uh, you try to see if there are not major flaws. If you remember the recent, uh, uh, the recent events with WikiLeaks and et cetera, uh, basically what they did uh, is that they went into the NSA, the National Security Agency, and the National Security Agency had identified what we call zero-day faults. What is a zero-day fault? Is a weakness of an operating system. In this case, many of them were weakness of, of Windows or weakness of OS. And basically, they kept that and they developed tools that in a case of need, they would use it in warfare or use it in spying. 
Okay, and they didn't bother to tell Microsoft that this week weakness existed. So the moment that that weakness was divulged, some people decided to kidnap computers. And what happened there is that uh, Microsoft then knew that there was this weak weakness and they patched it. But they didn't patch the old computers. Many people just didn't put the patch up. And then there was all this kidnapping of computers and event some requests and et cetera, et cetera. And so what does it say? They say that most software, most applications mount on top of each other. They have, all of them will have weaknesses. You change technology, you change the usage, but you don't really change the application unless you have to. And all of these piggyback together will be a constant, constant uh, liability, a constant danger on cybersecurity. And if you start thinking about AI, AI will be mounted on all of these using a lot of this data, using a, a lot of the traditional application. Some AI will be in large cloud receptacles, like understanding words, understanding language, uh, passing text. And some AI will be sitting as simple rules in your laptop or in your, uh, or in your cell phone, obeying uh, rules that were developed by machine learning and being updated as we speak. And of course, many of these applications sit on your computers or in your cell phone, and they are constantly being updated by the manufacturer. So they have a lot of backdoors. So this is the way to think, to understand that the moment you develop something, the usage is very low, cost is very low. And therefore, typically you develop it if you're going to make money. If you're not going to make money, you don't develop it. So there are many, many things around that uh, have a lot of data. You could do many things like, for example, monitor everyone running. Uh, the Boston Marathon, but you haven't developed the application because it's too expensive, too difficult. Now, if uh, someone in New York City develops a marathon app to follow people up and group source people running with the app and capturing their running, the speed, the health signs, and etc., applying it to the Boston Marathon or to the, uh, to the Los Angeles Marathon is much easier. And so think about piggybacking, think about that, uh, you know, knowledge is going to be one knowledge on top of the other one, on top of the other, on top of the other, doing special things and all of them unsafe. And that's something to be taught carefully. And so his first thing is about if something comes free, why does it come free? Because someone else developed it and it's available. And then the question is how you're going to use it. We all use, uh, we all use Google, okay? Uh, or some other search engine, most likely Google. If we all use Google, uh, if we all use Google, um, we are in one sense paying for the application by giving them our data. And there is a lot of talk about creating charges for people to use your data. And when that happens, if that happens, which I think will, uh, what's going to happen is the whole economics of free applications is going to change, which is very interesting. Uh, so in addition to, the, to what they say there, they say, living a world, uh, we are living a world of limited possibilities, uh, of astounding possibilities, and uh, with digital, uh, with digital uh, applications, uh, opportunities. The second one, the, info, the information brought out by software, by digital software and 
and I'm trying to be word the way uh, the way they are thinking about. They say that there will be illimited possibilities. And the third one is uh, digitization is going to create a lot of challenges. And this is what I was talking earlier about the different challenges of piggybacking and mounting this thing today. Um, and then they talk about social engineering, uh, and they talk about uh, uh, basically changing how society works. Um, I, the example that they like to use, I like to use, is uh, the story of Luddites. Uh, technology started developing this automation of creating uh, creating shirts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and they try to create automation. And, uh, and Edward Lut basically rebelled against that. So there's going to be so much unemployment. Uh, all the people that today uh, build build clothes, build anything related uh, to clothes, are going to be unemployed. So they actually attacked. Uh, places and destroy the machinery but there is no way to stop uh to stop that type of thing and so obviously what it finished up being is that lot there was a lot of functional unemployment for a while and progressively society uh society reabsorbed some of these uh some of these people into other jobs and i think that's going to happen with ai 